house and Gina's house and Brian's house. This is the Adam Carolla Show with Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, Dave Mason stops by, and Peter Diamandis returns. And now, since the kids are being homeschooled, he spent all night last night on Pornhub researching sex ed class. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but get on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for hanging with us during these interesting times. It'll be uh, an interesting archive when uh, people go back a hundred years from now and look at this time. They'll have all these podcasts to listen to to hear what the nation was going through. You know, we didn't have that with scarlet fever and, and other things. Spanish and the, flu. And the Civil War. Yeah. Good day, Gina Grad. Good day to you. And Ball Brian. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I talked to, um, you know, remember I was saying that this interesting time in our, in our life is bringing out interesting uh, moments um, because when you're, you know, when you're, when you're on your schedule, you're on your schedule and you have room for what's on your schedule and a little bit of peripheral stuff, but not much. And, and so does everyone else. And then when you get stuck in a lifeboat, now all you have is time to talk and think and, 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 and think of other concepts and other ideas right. and have conversations and thoughts that you would have never had. So um, I'm walking Phil yesterday and uh, Judd Apatow hits me up <laughs> and, and like right. Judd Apatow just wants to talk. La -di -da. You know, not really about anything. And, he and, wants a cabinet made. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to, I, I have a career to fall back on. I know. Now. So I'm like, okay. So me and Judd Apatow just have this long talk and Judd is a, a very, uh, thoughtful guy, a very nice guy, and a very talented guy. But um, there's some guys that are just nice, you know. And then some guys in this business are a little bit prickly. And uh, it's kind of, I, I, you know, it's a weird thing. Uh, the great uh, Danny Bonaducci said to me once. He said, you know, everyone always gives a bunch of shit to all the child actors, and they're always getting strung out on something or getting into trouble with the cops. But he went take any average dude and ask them how their friends are doing. It's like, sure. that's right. My, my best friends, uh, I had a best friend. He went to rehab and my other friends have had troubles with cops and substances right. and whatever. It's like, it's about average. And, you know, they always talk about uh, celebrities being this way and being that way. But um, it's, I think it's the same as uh, dentists and drywall hangers. Like Judd Apatow well, is a nice guy who happens to be a celebrity <laughs> And uh, Stephen Colbert is probably a little pricklier, but if they were both attorneys, they'd just be the same person yeah. as well, right? To further Bonaducci's point, like give a kid, give a child an inordinate amount of money and power <laughs> and, and imagine how any average child would turn out. Not well, well it's when they for, beat the odds, it's crazy. For sure. And Judd Apatow's been really successful for a long period of time but he just happens to be who he is yes. which is a super nice guy sort yeah. of menschy likes to laugh and blah 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 so also likes just, to do stand-up likes to do stand-up so we're just kind of going over this period and um we were uh but he had an interesting thing the reason i'm dropping his name is a to drop his name and then b, to bolster my argument of all these weird not weird people, but people I don't talk to that much coming out of the woodwork mm -hmm. with this strange downtime thing, feeling like, oh, I'd like to talk to this guy. And, uh, you know, the reality is, is uh, whether it's uh, 45 minutes with Patrick Dempsey or 45 minutes with Judd Aptow in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, that scenario doesn't exist when these guys are out doing what they're doing. No. And, uh, and, and when I'm doing what I'm doing. So that was kind of nice. But then he said something at the end. Uh, he goes, uh, oh, hey, I got to hop because I have a, I think it was a four o'clock Zoom cocktail party. And I thought, yeah. oh, yeah, there <laughs> must be a lot of that good. going on. I was this close to oh, going, yeah. who's in on this shit? Can I hang? <laughs> or just take a screenshot. Good. 
<laughs> right. So I was like, I'm already on the phone and I like to, <laughs> I like to do my day drinking, you know, but it was halfway like, there. Yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, there's gotta be, yeah, there's gotta be people throwing cocktail parties on zoom. Right. Or there's there my, there are. A few of my friends and I, us are doing uh, Tuesday nights at like nine o'clock uh, after the kids go to bed and uh, we're all getting on zoom, sharing some cocktail or wine or whatever yeah. and hanging out. It's nice to see our friends. We don't, like you said, these are people who we ostensibly are very good friends with, but we don't actually talk to them that much during the week. Adam, yeah. This is kind so, of my perfect thing. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, next week, Dan Dunn is coming on and uh, he sent bottles of booze to all you guys. And we're going to be doing a cocktail party on this show. He's going to we'll show you the same cocktails thing. next week. I, uh, from the bottles I received, it looks like we have an emphasis on tequila. Um, and that should be a rip roaring show because normally when we do it, Dan comes in, we all drove ourselves in and, we sip. uh, we sip, uh, we can guzzle. I, I, I say we do a full this is show. Not this essential employee. Oh yeah. But Tina, you, don't you want to know what I really think of you? Oh, more than anything. Hey, it could be good. It could be good. We don't it's know. It's a nice rule. Only you know. Only I know. <laughs> well, we're going to find out when we're Dan find Dunn out. gets in on oh, this shit. shit. <laughs> All right. So that was uh, uh, the virtual cocktail hour was kind of fun. I'd uh, only imagine that Judd would have some pretty cool cats on that, on that call. But it, it, was, it was nice to uh, catch up with him. Um, he, he's just finished if i was asking him uh what's this doing to your schedule because who knows what his schedule is exactly yeah. and he said he just finished his film and uh it just literally just like did the color correction and the wrap uh, not the wrap of filming the wrap of post in like the edit bay and then just like shook elbows with the guy and went home like so yeah. his you know his in his world, the timing was perfect right. for work because he just finished his Pete Davidson movie and then went home. But the movie's not coming out now. No. Oh, yeah. So It'll be a while. Right. So it's great timing on, on one respect and horrible timing on the other respect. Which I'm sorry, back up. Pete Davidson movie. Yeah, Pete Davidson is... They're doing an... I'm, I mean, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but the movie's coming out. I'm so everyone yeah. knows that. Comedy, I imagine yeah. starring Public Pete. Public knowledge. Davis. Right, right. But it's sort of the theme is Pete's dad died on 9-11. And right. that's kind of, and, and uh, you know, I told Judd, good for you. Like, I, that's what he did with. Um, train wreck. Train wreck. Amy right, Schumer. He did with Amy. I yeah, he, he, he found what she what she was about tapped yeah, into that yeah. and did that. It's yeah. not a, it doesn't, Very it's well. not a, yeah, it's not a documentary, but go find the person, go find out what they want, what they do, what they're thinking, what their desires what are, what their through. pain is, what they've been through, and then just make it about that. It's, it, it always goes wrong when they go the other direction. You know what I mean? You get, yeah. you get night at the Roxbury. Yeah. And you go night at the Roxbury. It's the, exact opposite of something like train wreck mm -hmm. right like you you've you've done nothing that in reality it's not authentic in any way it, it's it's pure you know shtick or, or whatever it's a sketch right you know what i mean right and, the, and that works in my mind like formatically that works for three and a half minute snl sketches it just mm -hmm. doesn't hold up over a hour and 45 minutes or I, when, on rare occasion yeah the rare occasion is uh like wayne's world when those characters are kind of authentic and kind of versions of those guys and they, like they're born from truth they're not the roxbury guys who are funny but they're silly you know what i mean right like, wayne's world they're like you can identify with those characters yeah, like they were like, a I, know, I know a guy like that yeah yeah and sometimes it it's just about execution it's not like this never works and this always works it's the execution of it, but by and large, um, the great uh, Pat Travers, I think, <laughs> was it Pat Travers who sung Boom Boom Out of the Lights? Lights? Yes. Um, I think, oh no, maybe it was Beck. I'm trying to think one of those guitar <laughs> They're guys. Often They're often confused. often <laughs> confused. No, not Beck, Jeff Beck. Oh, so Jeff Beck. <laughs> different Beck, sorry. You can understand our confusion. Yes, I get it, yeah. <laughs> Jeff Beck, Pat Travers, anyway. <laughs> So they had an album called Go For What You Know. And I always thought the reason Mr. Bertram was so successful is because 
went for what I knew. I knew the subject. I knew the character. I knew that oh. place. And the reason it wasn't kind of one and done, because really my first thoughts when Jimmy told me to do a character was like, I'll be the gay florist <laughs> and I'll review you know, movies. But on type. I could have pulled that off for two and a half episodes but it wouldn't have had legs, yeah. you know what I mean? I, it had to be something I knew. And I think, I think Judd's smart that way. He finds interesting subjects and then goes, let's massage this so right. it's about what you know. As they say in improv, uh, advanced improv, play to the top of your intelligence. Mm. Oh, that's funny, I never was told that. Oh yeah, no, that, no. that's, I think it's a, I, I wanna give credit where it's due. I think it's like a UCB thing. And I think oh. it's like, mm. once you get past, you know, the, 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 the basic and you got the, the mechanics down, then like you wouldn't, you, if you were doing an improv scene, you wouldn't be the gay florist because you run out of material after about 90 seconds. If you right. were a, uh, you know, gay um, architect, you would probably have a lot more material to work with because you know about architecture or carpentry. Either way, as long as I'm sucking a cow. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Brian. That's as that's the, yeah, the baseline of your well, knowledge. I was like, I was like Chug Dick, we're good, but go with one where, that's got legs. That's right. Um, all right. Uh, sadly, on a sad note, Adam Schlesinger, Fountains of Wayne, you guys have probably heard this, yeah. died. They saved the corona or complications from coronavirus uh, at age 52. So young, uh, relatively. I obviously had some dealings with him because he, he wrote the theme to Crank Yankers. He, um, I think the Crank Yankers premiered uh, the night that he died. Um, mm. The second batch, I'll, I'll figure it out. Max Paddock can figure it out. Anyway, um, super sad, uh, super talented guy. Uh, wrote, uh, obviously, that thing you do and, and like musicals and Fountains of Stacey's Wayne. Mom. And, hmm? Stacy's mom. Stacy's mom. Uh, a rare, uh, as I've said, it is a rare exception when somebody can do a movie like uh, that thing you do, or also like uh, music and lyrics, uh, Drew Barrymore and uh, mm -hmm. that, where the hit song actually sounds like a hit song. Hit song. Yeah, there's yeah. a bona fide pop song. Right, where it's like, oh, that's how you know someone's at the top of their game. When they're right. writing a movie, yep. I say the same thing. It's like, when they do a movie about stand-up and the person's <laughs> stand-up is really funny so that people in the theater are laughing, not just the extras in the club right. are laughing watching it. But Adam had that ability to write a pop song and, and, had a, and, and would stretch out in a lot of different genres. And we, uh, again, worked on uh, uh, the Man Show bit, Retro Rock and Rock. And I don't want to... Um, screw up the story too much but it was a man show bit that it was an idea that i had for a long time and eventually i think in our fourth season we did it it was uh my love of all that stupid rambling rock and devil woman rock and and all that kind of stuff and we um i think as we did it is daniel probably knew adam um New York guy and everything. And I think we were feeding him like, here's what we're doing. Here's the lyrics. Here's what we're looking for. Like, here's some of the song titles. And then he would send us the stuff that he was working on. He's just to a totally prolific guy. It's also one of these guys where if you look at his story, you kind of go, oh, there's time. There's time to do things. You know what I mean? And like, you can work on this and work on that and do this. Like, you could produce a band you can have your own a ba your own band and you can work on a stupid man show bit called retro rocking rock but we'll we'll play you a little of it just to just so you can hear some of the songs music today i just don't get it hey i'm adam carolla you know in my day rock and roll wasn't about boy bands or this robot crap our songs were about drinking and brawling and rambling. You're not going to find these lost treasures on the radio, but you will find them here. Pure retro rock and rock. 20 songs that rock so hard, you'll think you died and went to hell. Songs about whiskey. Whiskey girl. My, my, my whiskey girl. Going up to 
All, all the titles keep scrolling back. And songs about hard living, hard loving women. To rambling. Yeah, there was one. I, if you read the titles, they'll make yeah, you laugh. So there was uh, Mama was a truck driving man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I just saw that one after like 20 years and it made me laugh. I don't <laughs> think I wrote that one. Going back, parentheses, there. <laughs> so stupid. It's stupid, but it was such a, it, I don't know. It was, it was fun collaborating. I'd, I'd never written any songs before obviously i didn't write these songs i just sort of came up with some of the titles and some of the lyrics and like sent it and then he did a killer job of assembling it and arranging it and i don't know who was singing like um uh 18 let's see on a rambling highway or, or any of that stuff i i don't know if he sung some of it i think he got guys yeah. to sing some of it it was just a also, it's before all this uh, Zoom and everything. It's like you'd have to wait for a while, and then he'd, like, he'd send you probably a file or maybe even send you something physically, like in the mail. But um, he was a super talented guy um, and, and diverse. Just did a whole bunch of different things. Like he did music. He did everything music. And uh, it was a little lesson in, in, in almost everything. And uh, his is a good one. His is just go out there. And if you love music, then do Broadway stuff and do like jingles and do. And also, um, this guy <clears throat> was doing that thing you do was what 96 or oh God. Something? I think oh I was God. looking for it. I, I think it was I think I looked it up. It, it was probably 96. The point Sounds is, is right. He's working with Tom Hanks and being nominated for an Oscar in 96, 97. In 2002, the Jack Offs from The Man Show are going, I want you to help me with this thing. And he's Got going, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he wasn't going, fuck no, I'm working yeah. with Burt Bacharach. He was like, oh, okay. And he just did everything. Yeah. And uh, that's a, I, I think there's, a, there's something in it there. So anyway, uh, Someone younger than me and uh, someone who I've worked with, at least, I, I, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm, you know, this thing where you go, he was a friend. It's like, we weren't, we weren't friends. I respected him from, a, from afar. We were You're acquainted. A little bit. And now I was uh, talking to Dr. Drew and I said, well, what, what, what do we need to know? Like, I, I heard he was on a ventilator. And then he was, somebody said in a coma, but he wasn't in a coma. He was just sedated. And then the next day it was like, oh, he's coming out of it. And they're cautiously optimistic and he's doing better. And then he's dead. And so I said to Drew, how does that work? You're in a hospital. You're being taken care of, tended to. You're, you're in bad shape and then the next day you're in a little better you're in better shape yeah. and then the next day you're dead how's how's that work in a hospital and he said i don't know but it sounds like he may have had a heart attack or there may be a heart issue so the yeah. getting better and then dying is you had a heart attack in the hospital and he said the coronavirus not only puts a stress obviously you get a stress it's like when there's an earthquake and they go, this guy died of a heart attack, like during the earthquake, like the right. old guy died of it. You can be stressed. But Complications said, from an earthquake. <laughs> yeah, but he said, Drew also said there are, the coronavirus puts a stress on the heart or does something to the arteries or whatever it is. So it does 
go after the heart Jesus. and that, there's the stress. That makes more sense because when it's reported like, oh, he had an underlying condition of heart disease, you think, well, what the hell does that have to do with anything? So if you already have some heart issues, then that makes sense. Well, I, I, I would suspect as all speculation. And, and I'm I not never, saying he had heart disease, I'm saying in general. Right, um, it's all speculation, but I would assume if you, if this is the trajectory, you had this, it was bad, you went in, it started to get better, and then the next day you died, that sounds like there's something going on with your heart that people are unaware of, maybe even you, you go in with this and this is what happens. But either way, we'll, uh, we'll see, I wish, they just say died at 52 from coronavirus. I wish they would say no existing, no pre-existing conditions or pre-existing conditions. Or if there's, in, in, I just want it specified that there was nothing he was suffering from right. going in or, or tell us. It, it, it's kind of driving me nuts. They but anyway, may not I, know till an autopsy. They may, I, they may not know. I think they can say, sorry, Brian, one no, second. Sorry. I think they can say, no known pre-existing right. conditions if they wanted to. But yes, Brian. This is going to surprise you, but I'm not a doctor. Uh, but mm. this, this, the, this placating effect of saying like, oh, it was a pre-existing condition is, is kind of, um, it's a little slippery slope-ish or a little, uh, here's what I'm trying to say. Like, Vinny was on the other day and was talking about like, oh, if you're obese, that, that's like a pre-existing condition. You know what I mean? Like that, that could have uh, mitigating effects if you get coronavirus. And yeah. I looked it up. According to CDC, 40% of Americans over 20 are, are obese. And someone tweeted us today that like 88% of people are technically overweight or out of shape. I mean, this, the, the pre-existing condition thing isn't just... Uh, heart disease and cancer and whatever. It's like, if, you, if you're compromised in some way, if you're overweight, if you're obese, if you have hypertension, whatever it is, like that's a huge percentage of the population. That's yeah. half, the pe half the people on, the, on, the, on, the, on this show the other day when Vinny was on had cancer. Well, and that's, that's what I was saying hmm. the other day. Vinny, sorry. <laughs> that's what I was saying the other day about like, you know, kind of just sweeping it away with, well, they had pre-existing conditions. Yeah. Well, if you see what the pre-existing con condition list is, asthma, bronchitis, you know, things like that, that we all have. Um, and just a, a little mid show, uh, show prep, um, Adam, Steve Gregory from KFI would love to come on and clear up any press related questions. So if you have guy. those, he, I love Steve Gregory because nobody pronounces his own name. Like Steve Gregory. He has a he hell of a lockout. Knows, How do Steve you do it? Gregory. Come nice. On, KFI nice. Yeah. But he, he doesn't mind pissing off, you know, anyone he's doing a, presser with you know in terms of asking a, a question that's uncomfortable or whatever and he said if adam has a question i will give him an answer you know so he doesn't beat around the bush whatever he knows he's happy to share i will uh, look forward to that we'll arrange it yeah. uh yes good point uh i would like to know if the person was morbidly obese if they're carrying around 20 extra pounds that does compromise you to a minuscule or some percentage i wouldn't need to know that but i would need to know pre-existing conditions in in some sort of realm of whether it's pertinent or not right i i'm, I'm what i'm saying is is was adam a perfectly healthy active 52 year old who was just cut down by this right. or was there something else going and and, and it's it's not going to be an exact science i'm just saying um, it, I like a little, I like it a little more specific, but, uh, we'll see. And some of that'll come out I mean, either way. He shall be missed. All right. Dave Mason is on Dave. Let's see. Do we pot up, uh, Dave Mason? He's joining right now. He should be turning on his mic any second. All right. BetOnline.ag. He's going to give us, uh, a couple of, uh, ideas of things, uh, we might want to wager on from home during this, uh, downtime. One I didn't know was uh, one is um, WrestleMania. <laughs> Wait, Wait a second. Know you could gamble on what a world! <laughs> what a world! How there have to be prop bets? I think yeah, the like endings long, are generally how long decided. This match will go or something like I that. I don't know. You tell us, Dave. Are you on? No, no. Get, get out of here. You can bet on uh, who's going to win the each of the matches. Whoa! Yes. <laughs> yes. Come on. What a world! Uh, come on. 
how are they doing WrestleMania this year? Yeah, it's it's all, it's all pre-taped um, in front of nobody and <laughs> empty stadium and pre-taped. We heard that they're gonna, you know, obviously wrestling is matches are predetermined, so it's always kind of challenging offering odds. But you know, you keep the limits low, just offer them for fun. You know, a lot of people bet them. Um, we we have a guy, a handicapper who loves the sport. And he's really good at it. So we're, we're lucky there. A lot of books shy away from this stuff, understandably so. But our guy, he, I mean, he lives and breathes this, that leads us wrestling. So, well, um, but we, we yeah. heard that they're going to, we, we actually heard that they're going to, they, they're, I don't know if it is true, but he told me that they're taping these matches with both outcomes. So like the, the Brock Lesnar oh. match, he wins and they, they tape it that Drew McIntyre wins. So I guess at the end, you know, only Vince McMahon will know and push the button on which way he wants it to go, which is a good idea. And that helps us out a little bit as well. Um, you know what I like about Vince McMahon? He's one of these guys that has a powerful chin and a weak chin simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, you normally don't see that on. in the same yeah, guy. He's got yeah. this really powerful chin <laughs> and kind of a soft chin. And kind of recessive. Normally we leave it up to this guy to have the soft chin and this guy to have the hard chin, but he has both at the same time. Also, it's <laughs> funny when I, when I think about when you say we have a guy who handicaps uh, professional wrestling, I want to be fair because when I hear about like a single lady who works from home, who has three cats, I just tack on 40 pounds uh -huh. to whoever we're talking to. Uh, fella that handicaps, apps professional <laughs> wrestling i'm gonna tack 50 pounds onto that yeah ombre that's the right thing to do he, 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh god i hope you don't listen to this and now uh, yeah, yeah he, he could probably he could probably drop a few i don't know about 50 he's he's good dude a little bit on the nerdy side but uh <laughs> all the guy great worker he knows his numbers i'll tell you that much but he's a <laughs> uh, He's a heavy set fella. No, I don't think so. You know, you, you know, you, we can all drop a few. I mean, maybe drop 10, 15. Go He's a, little a teddy bit. bear. His, work, yeah, his workstation maybe. is coated in Cheeto dust. <laughs> could do a little intermittent fasting for a few weeks, maybe take it off. I, I, I'm not going to say 50. That, that's, 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 that's a little extreme. Yeah. It's He's like 5'8. <laughs> He's probably sitting there all day just hearing. Can you smell what the rock's cooking? Yes, I can. <laughs> it smells like hot wings and nachos. <laughs> All right. I would love us just to figure out what the job was and then we could just tack tack the pounds on. That would be a that would be a fun that'd be a fun gig. Well, it's super easy. Like when I, I used to be poor, teach boxing, and do carpentry. Oh and svelte. I I walked around like 173 pounds. Insinuate. You know? Now I I do a podcast from my home oh. theater and I'm up 25 Keep pounds. Going up. Keep going up. What else? How else could this go? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm sorry. So uh, Dave, what else? What do we have? Professional wrestling. What was the other sport that I found kind of interesting? That ping pong, table to Russian table tennis. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. The, yeah these Ru these Russians are ruthless, man. They're they're, they're except for Khabib, he, <laughs> he's not fighting. But uh, you got Russian ping pong, uh, hockey's going on still. There was some volleyball going on. I, they might. I'm not sure. I think volleyball. Russian volleyball <laughs> players might be on the side. But yeah, it's, it's table tennis. We put it up, you know, after the NBA went down and all that. We were scrambling to put content on the sites and sports, and there are some leagues across the world that are going on, and we never had table tennis on. We put it up there, and people are betting the hell out of it, especially live. I mean, I, I tweeted something about it, and uh, some guy hit me up, and he's like, oh, yeah, table tennis is the best sport to bet live. There's, there's quick, It's so quick and fast scoring and it, it going back and forth, left and right. So, I mean, who knew? But, yeah, we're getting a ton of uh, Russian table tennis well, uh, betting. and Checks. it doesn't have to be sports either. Apparently, you can bet on who's going to be cast in what role for the Tiger King movie. Yeah, absolutely. We put those up two days ago. So uh, <laughs> those are those are a lot of fun. And we're going to have some more Tiger King that's props uh, coming on soon. So that, that's all. Yeah, entertainment and anything. You know, we, we've upped our game in enter entertainment, NFL draft props. We have like almost 100 of them up. So, you know, we keep taking bets. You know, casino and poker are doing the heavy lifting. But uh, the sky's on the sports book where we're, we're getting innovative here, getting creative, earning our paycheck. Is the UFC fight 
going down so Tony Ferguson is not fighting Khabib? Khabib can't allegedly can't get out of Russia or well he said he couldn't get out of Russia and then then uh they said you can't take a private jet and then I just, yeah I think he just pulled out so that that fight is off for the fifth fifth time they tried to fight and it's off once again so the rumors are Justin Gagey versus Tony Ferguson which would be a hell of a fight but uh it's not official yet. I hope that goes down. That would actually be a more entertaining fight, to tell you the truth. That will be a slugfest, but yeah, we'll see. Know, we'll, we're holding out hope here. There's certain advantages to coming from Russia and living in Russia versus living in La Cunada, Flint Ridge. And what I'm saying are the Glendale area. Because if somebody says to me, hey, I need you to come in and do X, Y, and Z, and I live in La Cunada, I can't go, yeah, no, they won't let me come in. Man, there's no way to get there, and they just don't. They won't let. If someone comes from Russia or lives in Russia, I will believe everything they say. All they have to go is, "Yeah, there's no, we can't, can't. I can't. They won't let me." All you have to say is, "Like they won't let me," and then that'll be it. Like I could go, "Why didn't you return my email?" And you could write, "They won't let me return Russia. emails." Right? <laughs> Why don't you wipe your ass? Uh, yeah, they don't. They got a thing. I, I would just, I, I, I have no sense of what you can do and what you can't do. So if you didn't want to do something, you just say, they won't let me. Like, Khabib, does he live in Russia? Well, he, I mean, he trains out in Northern California, um, you know, with Daniel Cormier's group. So he's back and forth. I mean, home base is Russia. But, I, I mean, I think he was in California training, and then he went back just a few weeks ago or over a month ago, like right before people were like, well, what the hell are you going back for if you're going to fight? And then he got allegedly stuck over there, but people are saying you can take a private jet out. His Instagram post is something like, it's just not safe to travel and this and that and the other thing, which this, hey, uh, you know. by the way, th this guy's worried about safety. When yeah. he beat Conor McGregor, he went over the fence, over the seven right. foot That's right. fence, barefoot, uh -huh. landed on like Joe Rogan's lap, and then barefoot dove into the audience. Right. Like and, and imagine doing all this in a pair of board shorts. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> over the top, landing in a bunch of folding chairs and spent beer cans, and then diving into the audience to try to kill somebody with yeah. his own cell phone. He's not worried about getting nicked up. Yeah, it's a, that's the ironic part. These Russian ping pong players are throwing <laughs> caution to the wind every day, but the baddest man in Russia is on the sidelines. I don't get it, but. Whatever. I like him because I think he his hat, his fur hat, oh yeah, looks a lot like it's reminiscent of a, a badass that came long before Khabib did, which is uh, Lovey from Gilligan's Island. She would wear <laughs> Thurston Howell the Third's wife would wear the same kind of hat back when women wore hats. Oh, you know, can you bring back women wearing hats? I'd love to, because I've always said one of my very few superpowers is I look great in hats. So and any we, hat you got, I'll wear. We could, and, and it's also how we could tell the difference between the rich chicks and the poor chicks. Yeah, the does poor it have a long poor feather? Hats. Yeah. yeah you had a hat box? A little Dutch boy, yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, Adam, Adam, good news. You can actually gamble on the, uh, on, on, on the website there, the World Car Awards. Oh, like car of the year, manufacturing yeah, yeah. year, whatever. The car design of the year, world car of the year, world luxury car. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, you, you know a thing or two about cars. Use your insight, man. That's 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 how I make up all my money I lose on football, as I bet on the Oscars. I'm gonna put everything on the Kia Telluride. <laughs> at, uh, it's at an option. I test drove that car. <laughs> All right, uh, Dave, let me give you a plug. Uh, BetOnline.ag. Use the promo code PODCAST1 when uh, betting. And uh, send me a tweet at uh, Dave Mason, B-O-L, as well. Hope you're riding this thing out okay, Dave. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you want to occupy yourselves, uh, hop on there and uh, enjoy. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, All folks. Right. Be safe. <clears throat> let me hit, let's see. What? Oh, we got a Rich Banks song. Yeah, let's play. Let's play one more of Rich Banks songs, please. Trapped inside. I think you did it once. 
conceive me Looking for some penetration Hump, grunt, ejaculation Love child Conceived in quarantine Love child They COVID-19 Love child You had nothing to do Love child Because of who had flu My parents made me Trapped, bored, and shit faced on run. My father's dick couldn't social distance from my mom. They could have just kept masturbating, or they should have just watched Tiger King. The love that they were making while all the news was breaking, they'll end up regretting the child that they were begetting. Love child should have come on the boom. Again, when children visit the Smithsonian a hundred years from now, they will yeah. pull up these files. Oh yeah, know exactly what we were going through. These will be this in the will document the mood. Yeah, the mood of the country, the of humanity. There's going to be a fair amount of kids that may not have been planned for showing yeah. showing up, and mm -hmm. it'll be. I think. So I think. Like when those kids are going into their first year of college, like 18 and a half years from now, and uh, every everybody in that freshman class, they'll have to go, um, do you have a sister? Yeah, she's uh, 57. <laughs> uh, corona baby. Yeah, virus uh, baby. I got, yeah. it. I got it. Okay, I got it. Like if you have a brother who's 16 months older, fine. But I would ask everyone who's entering that freshman class, do you have a sibling? And if that sibling's more than 11 years or more yeah. than eight years away, it is Corona yeah. baby. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I just had a, a, a stroke of genius and I don't want to forget it. You know, we got the Gen X, the Gen Y, the millennials. You know what these kids are going to be when they hit 13? Hmm. Quarantines. Oh, that's good. Damn, Thank Gina. you. Damn, Gina. Somebody TM that immediately. Yeah. That's, that's the, going to be the next generation, the quarantines. Well, Brian, I'm sorry. Yeah. I coined the phrase home improvement <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Gina has now picked up the mantle with uh, quarantines. What you got, Brian? <laughs> some, I know, the pressure's on, some, man. Some pun-based gem, some <laughs> nugget of gold for tomorrow. Yeah, I got, We're waiting. I got, I got to workshop some stuff over here. <laughs> Better work it out. All right, let me hit the zip recruiter. Hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, uh, stacks of resumes, confusing review process today. Hiring much easier. Go to ziprecruiter.com slash Adam. Things are being shaken up. Uh, a lot of businesses are being hit hard and then a lot of businesses are hiring for the same reasons that some of the other ones are being hit hard. This, this whole situation is going out there. So let's get that resume together. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. Plus ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find the one with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applications come rolling in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one, spotlights top candidates so you never miss a match. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. It's ZipRecruiter, right, Dawson? Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Adam. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash ADAM, ZipRecruiter.com slash Adam. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right, quick break. We'll come back with Gina and her news right after this. News with crack. News with Gina. Give me the news with crack. News with Gino Grad, breaking viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad, trouble in the Middle East, celebrity drug meltdowns. Seek news with Gina, Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. A record number of Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week, and 
I'm not talking about like a record for like the last year or the last two years. This is big. From March 21st through the 28th, 6.6 million out-of-work Americans filed for unemployment. That's twice the amount of the previous week's record-breaking number, 3.3 million, uh, and more than what most analysts predicted, according to NBC News. And just to put it in further uh, clarity, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis is predicting the unemployment rate to climb to 32%. The unemployment rate in America was 24% during the Great Depression. So we'll see what we're on track for, but 6.6 .6 million uh, this week. Well, we're going to have to find out as much as we can find out as fast as we can find it out. And we're just going to have to not speak in sweeping terms. Like I hear articles and I hear politicians and they're like, uh, well, when do we go back to work? It's like, well, when it's absolutely safe and 100% for everyone, then we're going back. And it's like, uh, that you can't run a country, you can't run a business, you can't run a war, you can't run anything that when it's 100%, absolutely, you can't do that. You're going to have to start collect crunching data and like making decisions. And, you know, my feeling is like, I don't know why everything is one size fits all. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who should probably stay home. And then there's people in Wyoming who probably shouldn't or yep. folks in other areas who don't have to or folks of a certain age who can go back to whatever as long as they're not going back and living, you know, with an elderly person. You know, I have a, I live with a, a, a bunch of healthy, thin, young-ish people. There's no, we're not bringing it back. I don't, I'm not living with Nana. And there, it should be different when we don't live in New York. So maybe there should be adjustments made. I get it at the beginning, which we're, we're getting to the end of the beginning, I guess, yes. if that makes sense. The end yeah. of Act 1. The end of Act 1. Now it's time to just like make realistic assessments and decisions. That's It reminds point. me, a, a book I read by uh, the lawyer Vincent Bugliosi, speaking of uh, Mark Garagos and Reasonable Doubt, like he was talking about, you know, finding someone guilty or finding someone not guilty. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not beyond all doubt. It's not like, well, aliens could have come down and shot that guy. It's like, yes, that that is not reasonable. So put that out of your mind and now go from reasonable. Like there's a place where it's like, like you said, like you know, where we're absolutely safe, where we're reasonably safe. Like, you know, yeah. take, take the reasonable me measures at the right time. And when the right time is to go the other way, then we'll figure it's that funny. out. <clears throat> it's funny to bring up Bugliosi because I just heard somebody speaking. We about were just him. talking about him. <laughs> I was just, he, I was, he, he had this quote and I don't know if it's in Helter Skelter or not, but it was another thing he said, which is, it, oh, as, as it pertained to the OJ trial, when they that, kept that's saying, they, yeah, right. And they kept saying they screwed this up and they screwed that up and they screwed this up. They, you know, the, the guy walked through the, the, the crime scene and he, he, the blood was on his shoes. He didn't put the baggies on the shoes. He said, um, and we're, and we're kind of going through it now. It's like the government screwed this up. They said this, they did that. They had ventilators. They couldn't find the ventilators. Right. They didn't know where the stuff was. He, he said, Bugliosi he said, I travel the country. I order the same thing for breakfast at every hotel I go to for room service. And they quite frequently screw it up. Like I order eggs, toast and bacon and it gets fucked up a lot and these are professionals who do this for a living and he still eats it and he still eats it but the point <laughs> is, is don't expect the government not to fuck things up and don't expect the lapd right. not to fuck up it doesn't mean oj's innocent it You're just right. means yes shit gets fucked up of course yeah. It was, right. it was, in fact, that book, Outrage, about the O.J. Simpson trial, that I'm almost positive where that Bugliosi story comes from about reasonable doubt. And the same thing you're talking about, I read that book, and the same thing you're talking about is, yeah, they screwed up a few, a few things. He still did it. Like, right. it, it, you got him on technicality, I guess, that, like, they screwed this up and they screwed that up. He still did it. It's his blood was all over the crime scene. There is footage of everybody in a position of power, right and left, at some point, after the coronavirus came out saying, here's what to do, and they're all wrong. Right, right. So well, and, and to your them. point, to your point, we have SARS, we have MERS, we have, you know, swine flu, we have all these things. So I, but it does, this feels 
different. So hopefully after we all come out of this, we don't think, well, good thing that's in the past, business as usual, because you know what, there's going to be something else. And hopefully we won't be caught with our pants down uh, next time and we'll be more prepared because who we didn't know to be prepared until we had something like this happen. So yeah, I mean, we didn't, we're never, the, the problem is, is there's always, oh, somebody warned this and somebody said that, but no one well, ever really does. I don't, anything. I, yeah, I don't, I don't mean like that necessarily, but like, you know, hey, you know what, a couple extra ventilators, uh, if it costs us a little money, not a bad idea to have those in storage, you know, things here's, like that. Here's the, here's the problem, or here's what I don't think you're factoring in, which is you bring up all those other diseases. Um, we were not prepared for those. We weren't prepared for this, but our reaction oh, no. is so incredibly strong now because of our kind of a new world order. It's a new emphasis. It's first off, we're communicating much faster. Also, there's a new emphasis on safety and that we mm -hmm. never had in the past. We had some thoughts about it, but it wasn't an all out emphasis on safety. So even if everything is in place, we're still gonna emotionally react to some degree the same. And that is something we're gonna have to kind of contend with uh, in the future. Sorry, go ahead. So I, if, you, if you live anywhere in Southern California, I'm sure you've heard about this, but frankly, it's national news. Prosecutors charged a train engineer who oh, worked yeah, at the Port of Los this? Angeles Oy vey, with intentionally derailing a train at full speed near the Navy hospital ship Mercy because he apparently didn't believe the ship was there for reasons the government says it was. 44-year-old Eduardo Moreno was charged with, this is crazy, one count under a little-known train wrecking statute that actually carries a maximum sentence of 20 years, according to NBC News. Moreno was turned over to the FBI. A California Highway Patrol officer said he saw the train, which is used to haul shipping cargo, smash through a barrier at the end of the tracks before it drove through several obstacles, including a steel barrier and a chain link fence. It slid through one parking lot and another filled with gravel and smashed into a second fence. Uh, this is according to the affidavit. Moreno said he did it out of desire to wake people up. Mm. Jesus. Well, we went full Silver Streak. I was just watching the end of Silver Streak. <laughs> Timely. <laughs> the other day. Also, you know, there's a couple of scenes in uh, Silver Streak, couple of Still good end, good. couple of good end bombs in oh. there, and uh, a lot of shoe polish and uh, shucking and jiving with Gene Wilder. That probably doesn't doesn't hold up as well today. Oh right, okay, I remember that. Well, in the 70s. It, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing, which is that movie was a big hit and well received, and and so on and so forth when it came out in 1976 or seven or whenever it is and it never makes the rounds or rarely makes the rounds and i saw it and i was like oh this is a movie from my childhood that doesn't really make the rounds and i watched it and it's good like gene wilder's fantastic richard mm -hmm. pryor's great but you you there's a scene where they go into the bathroom and he puts the shoe polish on and starts doing the hey man yeah. and you yeah. go eh, maybe that's Eh. Maybe that's part of it. Yes. You, uh, you like to uh, you like to point out the uh, the absurdity of uh, the warning, you know, historical smoking, you know, under the rating. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I did Disney Plus, at least. I don't know if this is an MPAA thing, but I noticed this when I turn on uh, Peter Pan for Tessa, which she loves, by the way, the 19... <laughs> Yeah, 50, we've been watching that something. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. it says, um, God, I'm going to take a picture of it and post it uh, for the Adam Carolla show thing. But it says something like, uh, rated TV PG for like outdated cultural references or something like that. It's like outdated oh, something. Tiger Lily's Tribe, maybe. Oh yeah, the the, the red the, the oh, red man, the song about right. the red man, yeah. and yeah, they're, they're they're all speaking pigeon English. It's it, it's not it, it doesn't float well today. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I think Max Pata. I don't know. I think maybe someone tweeted me this, but uh, oh, we got that. Uh... The that scene? I'll she had the right hair. Yeah, I know. Sorry, no sound. He's, uh, they're also, the thing about bathrooms, they're at like Grand Central Station and they're in the bathroom. And the thing about bathrooms, it's sort of like cops in movies. There are certain times you need a guy in the bathroom yes. to experience what you're doing. And then there are times he, he's in a, huge train station, a crowded train yeah. station, and him and, uh, you know, Pryor and, and what, 
Gene Wilder have an extended scene in an empty bathroom that has 20 stalls in it in a train station. Yeah, there should be 100 people in a bathroom. Station. Nobody gets near. Like, could you imagine going into LAX and just having all the time in the world to hatch your plan alone in the bathroom? And they're just doing a whole now, scene. And I always say it. I always say it with cops. There's scenes sort of like if you take a look like like Pulp Fiction where they go into the apartment and they're shooting at the guys and then this whole long extended scene and there's no cops ever yep. showed up. And then there's other movies where you need the cops to show up because you go, 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 go. Like yep. you use them how yeah. you use them. There's multiple shots fired in that small apartment. You might gotta imagine someone's called the cops pretty quickly. I would be the worst because I would be, I would be standing there if I was John Travolta and he, he was, and, and Samuel L. Jackson was quoting the Bible or whatever it is. I'd be going like, hello, come on. We're on the eighth floor. TikTok. We just fired 11 shots. That was like nine minutes ago. Like, we got to get moving. There's someone yeah, in the cause, apartment. Because they shoot the dude on the couch, and then they go in the long soliloquy about Ezekiel 24, 17, or 25, 17. And right. then the guy, then Alexis Arquette comes out with the fucking gun. There is extended gunplay. I would be very nervous about the cop, but that's an example of a movie where the cops don't exist. And then at some point there's movies, you know, like Heat or something where the cops definitely exist and they're rolling, like they're showing up. Like they, this is either you have to have someone in the bathroom to react or nobody's in the bathroom, but it was an extended scene where Wilder put shoe polish on his face. Anyway, sorry. And was being taught how to act so he could pass. With That's the radio right. up to his ear and dancing yeah, around. Yeah, you can't dance. Yeah. Right. No uh, so speaking of ventilators and preparedness and all these things, a lot of celebrities coming out to, you know, offer help with equipment and, you know, fashion brands are now turn turning over to uh, making, you know, masks. protective gear and masks and yeah, things like that. Um, P.T. Barnum, Elon Musk, you know, loves to make his big proclamations of what he's going to do. He announced earlier this week that he had a thousand FDA approved ventilators on the way. And uh, there's only one problem with that. They aren't powerful enough to use in the ICU. In fact, a lot of uh, people don't consider them ventilators. What they are is they're called BiPAP machines, which mm -hmm. seem kind of like CPAP machines. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you, you can use them for breathing treatments from what I understand, but they're not, not only are they not usable for somebody in ICU that truly needs a ventilator, but to make matters worse, they could be making matters worse because, you know, the, um, the sort of ground zero uh, nursing home in Washington that this disease just swept through like wildfire, that could have been because of people sharing these types of machines for breathing treatments and that mm. they also, uh -huh. that it aerosolizes. So this virus hangs out in the air. And when you have steam and things like that being pushed out from these machines, it's sort of weaponizing it all over the room. So- mm. um, I just had a thought. Yeah. I'm a celebrity. Okay. I have means. Sure. I should own my own ventilator. You should. Yeah. Like a t your own tanning machine? Well, wait, you have, you have air compressors for your car tires and stuff. Don't they essentially work the same oh, way? Oh, yeah, just suck on that. Well, what I'm saying is, is just keep it on, on and off, on and off. When I was a kid, a few of my friends' dads had their own bowling ball and bowling shoes. Whoa. Yeah. They didn't go share one down at the lanes. They showed up with their own. And you want to you know, know why? Why? Because they could afford it, number one. Number two... It was their shoes and their ball. They didn't have other people's cooties on it, and they knew how it worked. Geffen I, probably has one on the yacht. Yeah. Why, why should Geffen show up to a hospital and them going, sorry, Mr. Geffen, yeah. we're out of respirators for you. We got some poor uh, migrant guy on it over there. Maybe when he's done, why not? Like, yeah. I know this sounds insane. I don't no. know how big these devices are. But if you said to me, look, um, after this event, this would never work, but I would still be happy with it. Anybody who's rich or anyone who can afford this, buy your own. Sure. Put it in your garage and put it in a zip, in a, a sealed bag, and it will put a stamp on it or something. And when you, if the shit goes down, you roll in with this thing. 
you have your own hey you race do you borrow other people's fire suits do you share uh, fire suits I, 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 that's laughable, i would think right? not that's laughable i would think not no does it come with the car do i share one no <laughs> i have my not. own that's right that's thank right. you i like when thank people you. do that kind of stuff like they go like you have your own eyeglasses right <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have your own toothbrush you your own floss right yeah. am i right yeah. Yeah. and uh wow. what about q-tips yeah I okay have those. do you share a pillow with a stranger or no. do you have your own pill i have my own pillow okay so what's the difference <laughs> i love that person that's my favorite person <laughs> the person that draws the straight line from the pillow uh, to the ventilator that's good same thing so, yeah adam when you were yes when you were in Little League, I don't know if, I don't know, hold on, I have a question. When you were in Little League, I don't know if this was a era thing or a kid on the Little League team who had his own uh, helmet or his own bat or something, you know what I mean? Like back in Little League, when you were 10, you like shared everything. The coach, the coach had like five bats and eight helmets and that was it. Yeah, I had, uh, I shared the bat. I shared the helmet. Yeah, Adam had his own monogrammed helmet. From home. <laughs> but there was I always had... the one kid is what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I had the one cleat. Um, I just wore my right one. Um, so it's interesting. There was so much bat sharing that it's like you wanted to warm up and you're like, where's my bat? Or where's the bat I use? It's like the guy who's up ahead of you is using that bat. He'll hand it to you when he's done with it. But um, the era of everyone having their own shit, like football helmets and football shoulder pads and everything, that didn't exist. There was a couple of rare instances when kids had their own football helmets and maybe a bat and that kind of stuff. But right. the, it was all pretty universally yeah. shared. Yep. Stuff. Just bring it in the big duffel bag and dump it out. Yeah, we had uh, oh, I had some weird little league coaches. Little league coaches, as I think <laughs> about it now, were definitely weirder than the football coaches. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. the, the football coaches were just pretty straightforward, just dudes, you know, windbreaker dudes, you know, big beards and windbreakers just yelling, calling everyone a candy, candy ass candy or ass. soft or, uh, you know, comparing what you did to women all the time. Like, I, my young daughter, Kelly, this, she's on the uh, gymnastics team. She's, in, uh, she's nine years old. She's on the gymnastics. She does more push-ups. <laughs> they do more push-ups than, like, that's all they did was use girls. Come on, ladies. Yep. Shame you. Yeah. Yep. Come on, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had the baseball coach. I love my baseball coach, but he was a little too into Little League. And he had the daughter who was three years younger than us. And it was always like, oh, yeah, my daughter could blah, blah, blah. It's like, all right, thanks. I had the ultimate. I had all different kinds in Little League baseball. Uh, and again, in, in, in football, they didn't have that much range or just big guys who used to play football who are too old to play football now and they're going to yell at young guys to play football i had a coach named mrs cruz her daughter talk about uh, breaking down barriers claudia cruz was her mm. daughter she was a lights out pitcher she was like peppermint mm. patty and just <laughs> lights out 11 year old, 12 year old wow. pitcher. She just was a lights out pitcher. Her name was Claudia Cruz. Ted O'Neill. Yeah. The mom was the coach. The mom was like, drove an 18 wheeler, had those kind of, <laughs> you know, those tight Wrangler boot cut, like kind of flared pants, but they were tight sure. up top and flared. Sure. She wore cowboy boots, but not, hey, look at me, cowboy boots, just like I wear cowboy boots, cowboy boots. She'd be up there with like the Tipperillo <laughs> kind of like, oh no, like a more cigarette, like a brown cigarette, like hanging out of her mouth that would bobble when she spoke. She had the fungo bat. She was like, all right, get one round the horn. You just throw it up and like whack it with one hand. Like she was a tough, Mrs. Cruz was a tough hombre. <laughs> Claudia was a great pitcher. And we had no qualms about having a female coach or like a female ace on the mound. It's like, like better, better for yeah. us. Better for you. And I put, I, this, put her yeah. in Adam history month. Yeah. Is it, is Claudia Cruz. Is that person probably North Hollywood, same age as me. She was inducted uh, into baseball <laughs> hall of fame last year. <laughs> she was good. <laughs> Mrs. Cruz had either fall asleep behind the wheel or maybe the more cigarettes got her she can't still be around but uh yeah it was also people forget that you could there's no better time to smoke 
than when you were coaching little league because you're just outdoors. Yep. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. you're yeah. outdoors and you're like, yeah. fucking smoke a cigarette. Who cares? My, my little league coach, uh, Dave Lohman, was a genius because uh, he had two hound dogs and um, oh, one or two, but either way, uh, you know, the video I showed you guys right at the Grand Slam over the fence. We've right, seen right it. Right over that fence was like a gulch, a gully. Was there a gulch? Do we need gulch and gully? There, no. was, there, was a steep, there was a steep drop off to an inaccessible area by humans, but he had dogs. And mm. after, the, after the end of like at the end of the week, when all the, cause all the teams practiced at that park. And of right. course there'd be a few home runs hit. He'd send it. He had his dog trained to go down and pick up balls. He got like brand new ball. He never bought a baseball in his life. <laughs> he just got brand new balls from this gully. It's so sad that like, I grew up in an era where baseball was a durable good. Like that was a oh, big yeah. ticket item. And I would have a couple of home run balls from Little League, except for I then used them to play over the line and whatever else we played because you needed to use them. All right, let me hit uh, Geico. You want to do a little bundling. You have uh, homeowners insurance. You have uh, renters insurance. You want to put them together with your automotive insurance. You go with Geico. You save uh, big bucks when you uh, bundle. At Geico, you go to geico.com, they'll tell you just how fast and just how easy it can be to bundle your homeowners or your uh, renter's insurance with your um, automotive insurance and do it quickly and easily at Geico. That is geico.com. Hey, uh, Max Paddock, can you scroll that screen? My screen looks different than Max Zapata's screen, so he has some stuff I, on. I there. did update it. Did, what is it? What does it say yep. on your screen? The chat, still... the, ch the chat doesn't scroll, Chris. It and just you... says 18 new messages. Yeah, you just have oh. to roll it down. Okay, so yeah, I, I didn't know that. I thought when it, if I if Adam just wanted me to send everything else to the heavens and then have the latest messages as, as the new message. That's what I've been doing. I didn't know it didn't scroll. Well, what you got to do is add those X's to the bottom so it rolls up, right? There was always a lot of confusion amongst this. Yeah. So my screen at the top says break news, but we don't want that on there, right? Got to right. scroll. So if you add stuff to the bottom, that'll, my, we've been discussing this for three sluster. weeks non, nonstop, but if you add stuff to the bottom, it'll scroll up, right? And it'll go out off the screen. Well, I've, I've been adding, yeah, I've been adding stuff to the top because the newest would be at the bottom. So for instance, if I did this and then, uh, oh, I think what we're calling the top or the bottom are, are different. Anyway, can yeah. you get it, Gary? You does Gary understand? This is amazing. I feel like, like, all right. There, I, there could be some confusion because I noticed there was an update to Zoom today. So I don't know if some of us have updated and some of us uh, haven't, but oh, it's, yeah. uh, it's behaving differently today compared to the last nine days. This, hey, Chris, you just found your Russia, buddy. There's <laughs> been an update to Zoom. Like, what am I going to go? Oh, bullshit. I've been checking Zoom all night. I've been on their website. There's no updates whatsoever. I have my all Zoom right. update yeah, tracker I, app. I have been updating the screen the entire show, so I didn't, and you weren't saying anything, so I didn't think anything was wrong with what I was doing. I, I'm, no, no, Chris, we've been talking about this for two weeks on every show I do. I am attempting to do this thing where the screen scrolls up and gets the old information off of the screen by adding new stuff at the bottom and pushing the old stuff. Has off. it not been doing that with it for everybody else, or is is, is it just my screen that's? I'll doing I'll get a new message alert and I will go and physically scroll down. So. Yeah, I'll get new message alerts. It doesn't scroll automatically. Ours is so the way mine works is he adds X's or checks yeah. and it pushes it off the top of my screen. Yeah, that, that's what I've been doing. But if if it's right, not but our screens are different as we've established and mine, my stuff still stays on at the top. Anyway, you can, oh, anyway, and we found the Peter Pan thing. Oh, you did. <laughs> Chris, right, we'll but the last, the last, it's just the uh, last line of the description. It may contain outdated cultural depictions. <laughs> it may. <laughs> Indeed it does. All right, let's do uh, one more Gina Grad. All right. Well, this is just a video that is fun to play. You know, everybody wants to, uh, get get in on the act and do a PSA and make sure we're all washing our hands and staying home. This one looks like he was forced to do it, mostly because he says he was forced to do it. Let's just let him explain. Larry David doing a uh, PSA for staying home, and I believe this is under the governor's Twitter. 
Hello, I'm Larry David. Obviously, somebody put me up to this because it's generally not the kind of thing I do. But I basically want to address uh, the idiots out there. And, and you, you know who you are. You're going out. I don't know what you're doing. You're, you're socializing too close. It's, it's not good. You're hurting old people like me. Well, not me. I have nothing to do with you. I'll never see you. But, you know, other, let's say, other old people who might be your relatives. Who the hell knows? But it, it, the problem is you're passing up a fantastic opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to stay in the house, sit on the couch, and, and watch, watch TV. I mean, I, I don't know how you're passing that up. Well, maybe because yeah, you're, not, you're not that bright. But uh, uh, here it is. Go home, watch TV. That, that's my advice to you. Um, you know, if you've seen my show, Nothing good ever happens going out of the house. You know that. <laughs> There's just trouble out there. All right. It's not a good it. place to be. I, uh, Larry's smart. And uh, I just got a, I just talked to August about it. I got his, told him to send his number. So I'm, we're going to try to get him on this show because he said, as soon as uh, we're done with the uh, curb, uh, I'll come on. So we'll uh, see if we can zoom him in. We'll work on that. Larry's a great example of just kind of owning who he is. Hell and yeah. Ellen is a bad example of it. And Rosie's the <laughs> worst the example time. of it, which is like everybody. And I think in a weird way, it, in a weird way, maybe Hillary lost the election because she went a little too much Ellen and not enough Larry David. Like, we don't care who you are. We just want to know that that's who you are. That's Trump. That's Trump's whole appeal. Right. We don't care that Lance Bass is gay. We care that we think he's gay and he's not telling us he's gay. That's what we care about. I, I'm telling you, it was 10 years of speculation about Lance Bass. The second he came out as gay, no one said another word about it, right? No one cared. Everyone we were bothered. We were bothered by it. Like, we're like, I don't, like, Hillary seems really, she's laughing it up with Oprah, but is she a good person? Like, I don't know. You don't have to see the mistake is we need a great person. We don't need a great person. We need an authentic person. Indeed. We, Larry David has become a billionaire by just being who he is. Man. We don't care. He, he literally just said like, look, you're not going to see me. I don't want to see you. You know, that kind of stuff. And we go, oh, it's so awesome. <laughs> well, he's just saying, he's just being so Larry. Yep. Yeah, I think, I think back in the day, you could pull this off. Like, um, you take uh, uh, Rock Hudson as gay. No one knew it. He could do it. We didn't know. We weren't going to know. We never found out. We know now. We're going to find out. Right. So don't do it. Just be that person. Be you. Be you. All right, let's Char bring it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. I was going to have Charles Barkley as an example. Perfect. He is who he is, and he's wildly popular. Perfect. All right, let's bring it home, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Peter Diamandis is uh, coming on to do uh, part two of such an interesting uh, guy that we interviewed yesterday. We'll talk to him again uh, in this uh, second half. First, I'll talk to you about Simply Safe Home Improvement. Two eyes in there. SimplySafe.com. Peel and stick up and running in uh, under half an hour. Batteries last up to 10 years. It is the best. It is simplysafe.com. All right, uh, Gina and Bald, another uh, yeoman's job turned in uh, by the twos of yous. And I'll do a one on one with uh, Peter right after this. Alcoa presents Definitely Not a Jew on the Adam Corolla Show. Dateline, Jacksonville, Florida. A 50-year-old man was arrested on charges of manufacturing, possessing, and threatening the use of a weapon or hoax weapon of mass destruction after he sprayed an unknown liquid on the entrance of a business from a bottle labeled COVID-19. Definitely not a Jew! 
Peter Diamandis back on the show for a second time because uh, we just didn't have enough time to get in all that I felt like we could get in the first time. Good to see you again, Peter. Good to see you too, Adam. Back um, by popular demand, no doubt. <laughs> At least, least I enjoy spending time with you. I uh, feel exact same way. And uh, I like your motif behind you, the Golden Gate Bridge. It's very soothing. Thank you. Thank Taken you. from the Sausalito side, I'm mm. guessing. Um, so we were sort of left off talking about uh, both of us big fans of the private sector and what they can do when motivated and what motivates them is money usually. Uh, and then there's the government and we're discussing that, but the government is also there to grow and they're also there to have more control. And anyone who's tried to do anything in the private sector or build anything, try to build anything in Southern California, you will realize that the government has a lot of rules and they don't speed things up for you at all. It all falls under the umbrella of safety, which they can hide behind safety. They, all the weak people hide behind safety. But what do we do? You have great beliefs in the private sector and innovation, and I love it, but I worry about the government not, I would have the government putting a, a, pardon the pun, a governor on it, slowing it down. What do you we're, think? We're going to have that conversation. Okay. That'll be yes. fun. Uh, so, man, oh man, it's, it's, it's both sides of the equation. And it's interesting, right? Because I think the internet exploded into its glory because there were no rules and the government wasn't ready to understand what the implications were. And so we saw this extraordinary, you know, amazing um, uh, emergence of, of the internet, you know, the early days of AOL that you and I will remember back in the, in the 90s. Um, and it gutted and reinvented a whole slew of industries from even mail service to information to reinventing libraries, all of these things. And, and so, yeah, the, the government, and there's an old saying, so I, I deal with the FAA on, in the launch vehicle and the aircraft business, and I deal with the FDA on, uh, the, on some of the companies I'm dealing with in longevity and, and vaccines and therapeutics. And there's an old saying that they are not happy until you're not happy. Um, right, <laughs> right. And it's interesting, right? So one of my companies, Adam, I did years ago, I don't know if you've ever heard of a company called Zero G. We, we do weightless parabolic flights. Mm -hmm. And, and we, um, NASA had been doing it for 45 years since the late fifties. And back in, in 1993, I wanted to fly on NASA's zero G airplane. It's just parabolic flight. You go up and down and it's called the vomit comet. We don't call it that. And right. It's, and, and they would film Tom Hanks in outer yeah, space. Apo Apollo in 13 was filmed there and we right. filmed parts. Of anyway. So I started the company in May of 1993. It took me 11 years to get FA approval. Right. And it was this crazy battle, which was literally the FA saying, listen, there's no way in the regulations that allow you to do this. And I'm going, there's nowhere in the regulations that disallow me to do this. So people are not motivated to approve things that are considered dangerous or different because no one benefit inside the government benefits from that. Literally, it had to go up to the FA administrator, Marion Blakey, who... Uh, was an amazing woman. I was sending people to Russia to fly on an Aleutian 76. They had to sit on the ground with a parachute on their back for takeoff and landing. And then finally, we got approval. So you say on the ground, you mean on the floor S sit of on the, floor the plane. Of the, yeah, sit yes. on the floor of the airplane. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I used to go into battles with the, with the regulators. And I would say, listen, I am not going to give up. You're going to either retire or die before I give up. And it was, right. I mean, it's that kind of a, of a mindset sometimes that's required, but under periods of intense stress, like right now, we're, we're, we're seeing, so I've got two companies are involved, one is in vaccines around the COVID-19 and one is around therapeutics. And we're beginning, I think there's a, a sense of, holy shit, we really need, we, the old way of doing things cannot survive. We need to take higher risk. And, and so the, the challenge is that, that, that higher risk comes with potential downsides and the government's always trying to cap no downsides, right? So when, when uh, one of the past heads of the DOT said, we want zero deaths 
in airline, like 100% airline safety, there's only one way to do that. You stop flying airplanes. Right. Yeah. Now, I, look, I, I agree. And the problem is you, us in the private sector, and I should, I should tell people this, uh, the future is faster than you think is the name of the book It's available now on Amazon. It's about how technologies and uh, businesses are being transformed and industries in our lives and just how fast things are changing in this society and uh, futureloop.com slash c19 is where you can go to get some good news about uh, what's going on in today's world vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 situation when all we're hearing is bad news but what I wanted to say about the, the government and I've dealt with them a lot in building and uh, I couldn't imagine FAA or uh, drugs uh, the other one was uh, F FDA, FDA. FDA. I couldn't imagine that. Just going, just going to the Glendale Building and Safety Department gives you hives. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. Now, and then what we're saying is, is this. I think we can all agree on basic safety things and basic sanitary sanitation things and things that make sense. It's. I lived in a house, one of the first houses I bought, crazy Hollywood house. And it literally took about 75 stairs to get to the front door. And when I was remodeling the house, at some point I blew out a doorway to the bathroom downstairs and the guy came in and he said, if you're gonna replace the door, it's gotta be a 32 inch door. And I said, well, I don't have enough room for a 32 inch door. And he said, yeah, well, you blew it out. So now you gotta replace it with. And I said, the 32 inch door is a code for handicap access. It's it's." It can't be a 28 inch door because you couldn't roll a wheelchair through it. And I said, yes, but nobody in, in a right wheelchair line. is ever gonna make it to this house because it's literally, it's like those stairs in between the streets in Santa Monica that people run for exercise. It was literally 80 stairs to get to the front door. So nobody with a wheelchair could make it to this door threshold. And he's like, the code is 32 inches. And so that is unreasonable. Yeah. And I've had a million of those exchanges, and you have as well. And when you're dealing with the private sector, you're still interested in safety, and you're still interested in progress, but you're also both reasonable because you want to get things done. Now, the government and the problem with the government is the guy can say to me, the door's got to be 32 inches, rules are rules, and call me for an inspection when it's 32 inches, I'm leaving. And he leaves. And I don't get a certificate of completion until I do what he says to do. That's not the way the private sector works. And the government is not going to work any differently than that because they don't have to and they're compelled to not. They don't care. So we have to do something that limits their control and limits their reach. And for some reason, we have a bunch of fucking dumb people who think it's a good idea to vote for bigger government, probably because they've never dealt with them like you and I have ever dealt, like you and I dealt with them. They live in fucking rent control apartments and don't give a shit. But what they don't realize is your companies that you represent are directly affecting them when you have those dealings with the government. Go. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it is, it is for sure frustrating as hell when you're trying to make a difference on the planet and you've got this ability to do things faster, cheaper, better, and there's a brick wall that you hit all the time. And so the, the, the difficulty is even, even crazier than that. So I'm dealing with this in the world of the FDA. So, for example, right now, if you have a new drug that, is, uh, that has the potential to save lives, and you want to make it available, you have this extraordinary long process that you have to prove it cannot do anything negative. And so while you're going through this process and it's a, a, the drug, you know, it's a decade of approval times, billions of dollars of work. And that period of time is one that people are dying from the disease you're trying to solve, but the FDA doesn't actually measure any of the deaths during the delay time. It only measures the deaths if you had used this drug 
would it have killed somebody? So we don't have a fair and balanced view. So one of the things, for example, in the regulatory side, and we're all thinking about our health during this time, is I'm thinking around, you know, how do we create a, um, uh, a accredited patient program, right? So how do you create a program where you say, listen, I'm an intelligent person. I've read about this particular drug. My physician's read about this drug. My wife or my next of kin's, and we all agree we want to try the drug and why does certain government, you know, parts of the government control whether or not I can risk things with my own life, the things that are important for me? And that, that frustrates me to no end because it stifles innovation. And we think about the incredible world we're living in right now. And what I write about in the book is how rapidly it's going to change. We're going to reinvent healthcare, right? Again, we talked about the notion that it's not healthcare today. It is sick care. The system takes care of you after you are sick. Um, and we're gonna reinvent insurance, finance, food, energy, transportation, all of these things in a way that is going to make the world for each of us, it's gonna become cheaper to do what we wanna do, it's become more available, and it's gonna become more personalized. I mean, when you think about what Google and Amazon have done to our lives, it's amazing. And a lot of the great innovations, when you say, hey, Name all the amazing things that are going on in your life, the powers that you have as an individual, what makes you capable to do things now that the wealthiest people in the world couldn't do 30 years ago. It is really the innovation coming from technology. What do you think the government's role should be vis-a-vis -vis information and you know, Facebook and Twitter and Google? And some of these people are censoring some people censoring some ideas, pulling some stuff down, labeling some other stuff. Um, what are they doing? What is your belief? Like I, for instance, um, I'm friends with Dennis Prager. He's got Prager U. Prager U has several hundred videos. Many of them are have a parental restriction on them that was placed there by Facebook or whomever where they can't be shown in libraries or schools. These videos are G rated, nothing, but somebody disagrees with their content. And so they're censoring them based on the content, not based on the words. There's no swear words. There's no nudity. There's nothing provocative about them. How do you, what's your thoughts on the future of these platforms having some editorial license, you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they're supposed to be, so what they are is just to paint a real simple picture. Uh, they're supposed to be a platform and the platform is a, a, a little plywood riser and anyone can come stand on top of this box and preach whatever ideas they have as long long as they're not telling people to hurt each other or using this word or that word. And at some point, the guy who owns the platform says, mm, I disagree with what that guy's saying. I think we're going to need him to come off that platform. And you go, but he's not inciting violence or doing anything. And the person who owns the platform is going, yeah, I'd like him to wrap it up. That seems kind of dangerous to me. And I'm not sure why they're doing it. But you tell me what your thoughts are. So... Listen, I, I think that uh, ultimately there is a transition in which a platform goes from being something that is for a small group, it's an experiment and such, where it becomes sort of things that people build businesses on, right? People build businesses on top of Facebook, for example, and it becomes more of a public service platform in that, and they benefit from all of it. So, I mean, the role, question is really what is the role of government in, in censorship and regulation? Um, and we talked about this last time we spoke, which was uh, around the notion of um, uh, how, much, how much responsibility does an individual have for, I don't like what Facebook is doing, I'm going to unsubscribe. I don't like you know, what McDonald's is feeding, I'm not going to eat there. And I tend to go more towards empowering the individual to make the choices. Now, the question of the government I think the government has a public safety requirement, but there's a reasonableness test. And I don't, I think there is um, an encroachment way forward. I'm more of a libertarian than I am anything else. 
And at the end of the day, I think the government has a role in, in public safety, uh, but not to the extent that it is uh, requiring um, and, uh, and beginning to, uh, to you know, go against the First Amendment of, of freedom of speech. So what do, you, what do you think about the platforms themselves doing a little editing? Uh, so, so I think, listen, I, I do believe that there is, uh, it's not black and white. I think that it, it is gray. And yes, when platforms are, uh, are uh, not, are allowing hate speech and allowing um, uh, elements that are driving people like in Facebook, we've seen over the years, you know, increased suicide rate in teens and so forth. I think that it is possible for platforms to use AI to look for situations of bullying. And I think it is when you have the ability to prevent that level of, of terrorism and hate and bullying and so forth, that it's an obligation of the platform to do that, to say, to create, to create a set of, uh, of rules that say, as a platform, um, these, this is the way you're expected to behave. We don't allow that. If you don't like that, go to some other platform and then to support those. Right. But what I'm asking is, is sort of politically, it's not, okay. I think we all agree that somebody goading some youngster on to commit suicide is a horrible idea. And unless you're an ultra, ultra libertarian, you'd go, all right, take that down. But what if it starts bleeding into just sort of politics that you don't like? I think there was a story a couple of days ago where somebody said, this is in, in your wheelhouse, Somebody said on Twitter, hey, this uh, coronavirus, it's not as bad as we think it is, but people need to start thinking about getting back to work. And I think Twitter took it down. Like they didn't yeah. like, they thought that was irresponsible. They didn't like yeah. the politics I, of that. I, I, don't, I, I don't agree that they should take that down. I believe that the community should be there. So, you know, when I'm on, I'm on Twitter actively a lot, just at Peter D. Amandus, and, and the community shapes, you know, when I, you know, when I'm making comments about, uh, something in particular, I'm reading the feedback and it moderates what I say next time. But I don't think that we should be taking it down. If they are, again, if someone is doing something that is dangerous or is, um, uh, is goes beyond uh, what are ethical right, and moral, but, but no, Twitter shouldn't be taking down an opinion. Right, but here's the rub the person that takes it down deems it as dangerous. See, we deem it as free speech yeah. and some and uh, ideas to consider. Like, yeah, we should be thinking about when getting back to work. We should of be course. thinking about how many people are losing their jobs and livelihood. We should, that, that is something that should enter our discussion. But the person takes it down, calls it dangerous. I, yeah. I'm telling you, you have to be careful, everyone listening. All this stuff is under the umbrella of safety. It's never under the umbrella of I'm in charge, I'll do what I want. It's always for the safety of the citizens or the community, we must X, Y, and Z. And, and that's a slippery, dangerous slope. I completely agree. Yeah. Let's talk, uh, let's talk uh, X prize. Yeah. I, I, I wish to tell people you're executive chairman of the X prize foundation. I am so in love with the X Prize and the concept of the X Prize. I love this notion of taking problems, throwing a little, putting a little, little carrot at the end of the stick and sending the private sector to go fix it, solve it, beat it, whatever it is. Um, yours is, uh, and I think the X, as I recall the X Prize to me started off leaning a little more toward aviation yeah, with space, space flight. Let me let me tell you the story. And by the way, Adam, given you're in here in LA, please come get get involved. Um, I'll tell you. So, I grew up in the '60s, passionate about Apollo, passionate about space flight. That scientific documentary, Star Trek, really got me going mm -hmm. about where we're going in the future. And I gave up on my chance of becoming a NASA astronaut. And I read one day uh, Lindbergh's biography called The Spirit of St. Louis. And I find out that he flies New York to Paris in 1927 uh, to win a $25,000 prize. And I go, that's it. I'm going to create a prize for private space flight. And uh, I, 10 million was enough money. I was in the, in the rocket business 
in the space business. I knew that 10 million would be enough to spark an entrepreneur, but I didn't want the Boeings and the Lockheeds and the Airbuses going after this. I wanted teams that were new and a novel approach. So I announced uh, a $10 million prize. I had no idea who was gonna put up the 10 million. This is back in 1996, I didn't have 10 million at the time. And we ended up, uh, I called it the X prize, where the X was a variable to be replaced by the name of the sponsor, the Ortiz, oh, I see. the Pulitzer, the Nobel, who's gonna put right. up the money for this? And you had to build a private spaceship, carry three adults up 100 kilometers, land safely, and do it again within two weeks. And we had uh, 26 teams around the world from seven countries who spent $100 million going after this. A guy named Bert Rutan up in the Mojave Desert, yep. backed by, by Paul Allen, wins the competition. I was able to recruit. Uh, and then Richard Branson came and bought the rights to the winning spaceship to create Virgin Galactic. And since then, oh. we launched... Yeah, so Virgin Galactic came out of the original prize. And since then, we've launched about $200 million in X prizes across the board. Uh, Wendy Schmidt, Eric Schmidt's uh, wife, when the BP oil spill was going on back in 2010, Jim Cameron had joined our board and said, you got to do something about this competition, about this problem in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So we created a prize asking teams to reinvent how you clean up oil spills on the ocean before they hit the coastlines, before you destroy the fisheries and such. And so we had like 380 teams enter that competition. Uh, the final, the winner increased the rate of oil spill cleanup on the ocean surface 600%. Uh, we did a prize for water. Um, and, you know, we talk about water wars, water scarcity, uh, but there's so much available water actually in the atmosphere, there's quadrillions of liters of water. So we said, can you build a device that pulls water out of the atmosphere and gives uh, a thousand liters per day in 24 hours for two cents a liter from all renewable energy? And that was one two wow. years ago. Uh, uh, we have prizes on reinventing how we produce food, uh, on the rainforest, on energy, on CO2. I mean, we got, it's amazing. And so if you go to xprize.org, you'll see the active X prizes. And really, in this world of rapid exponential growth with all of these, um, all of these powers that superpowers that individuals are having, right? You today have access to massive amounts of information. You could spin up a thousand processor cores on Amazon Web. You have access to quantum computers on the cloud for free we don't realize how much power that we have as individuals. So what we do is we say, here's a challenge, here's a goal, here's a target. If you solve it, you win. And these prizes range from a couple million dollars. Uh, our carbon extraction X prize will be a hundred million dollar competition. We're in the middle of building that right now. Um, and you win the money and the world wins the benefit. Right. So when I was growing up, um, it was a a lot of um, discussion about we're going to be out of fuel um, and the air is going to be so bad. So I grew up in Los Angeles. I remember what it was like in the early 70s. And it was basically we're going to be out of fuel and the air is going to be so bad for what's coming out of the exhaust pipe of cars. Now, somebody has no what nobody knew is somebody was going to invent a catalytic converter and a computer that uh, worked on en engine management and advancing and retarding timing and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, what comes out of a lawnmower is far worse than what comes out of a Ford F-150. It's a hundred times worse. So we never knew that. We never saw that coming. All we saw is the technology we had, which is no catalytic converter, no unleaded gas, more and more cars, more and more pollution. And what you're saying is, uh, the gestalt of what you're saying is, is there's so much technology and evolution and it happens so fast that these problems, like there's no water, they can't get water in Africa. It's like, yeah, because nobody has thought about pulling it out of the atmosphere and having it powered, being powered by a solar powered extraction. Yeah. And when, now, if you're thinking, well, we're just going to dig a hole in the ground and we're sucking all the water out. We can't get any more. If you're using the old techniques or you think about that way in terms of propelling an auto 
automobile, if you think of it that way. When I was in 1974, when I was 10, no one talked about solar power and Teslas and, and you know wind farms or anything. It was just, we're gonna be out of gas and then we won't have any cars. So you're saying that not only is that gonna happen in the future, but it's gonna happen so much faster because what I'm talking about, we couldn't use a computer to, to figure it out. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So uh, first of all, every, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. I want people mm -hmm. to hear that, right? And what I talk about, that's what I teach in my abundance digital community and singularity. And then if you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. And those two forcing functions are, are really uh, creating, making the world much better at an extraordinary rate. And we, um, we have this negativity bias. We don't realize the extraordinary world that we're living in. All we're focused on is all the negativity all the time because we talk about this. It's what the Crisis News Network feeds us all the time. So right. uh, there, was a, there was an environmental disaster in the 1880s and 1890s that was massive. As people were moving in from the rural area into urban downtown Detroit, Pittsburgh, uh, New York, um, you know, they were bringing with them their motive power, the horse. And as people brought more and more horses into downtown cities, the amount of horse shit literally was growing exponentially. And you can find articles that describe how, how awful it was, how bad it smelled, the disease that was coming from all of that. And it was the environmental disaster of those decades. And then it was solved in a very simple way. Uh, it was the car. The car right. came along and took away the need for horses. And now that's another disaster that's you know, another issue that's coming. And we're, people don't realize that we are in a period of exponential growth in solar energy. The amount of solar that we have 8,000 times more energy that hits the surface of the earth than we consume as a species in a day, 8,000 times. It's not that there's not a shitload of solar energy out there. It's not in a usable form yet. And that's what technology is allowing us. It's making it cheaper and more usable and easier to install day on day on day. And so we will head towards a uh, majority solar economy that will transform it. And guess what? The poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. And right. so they'll become net energy exporters. So we just have to reframe how we look at these things. And the same thing is true in every problem we have, at least in my opinion. Well, no, it's a very good point. If, if you take the 10 biggest problems and then you'll have the 10 biggest companies solving those problems, if you think or, about or, it. Or you'll build companies in order to solve that and you will grow to become a major force. Right, because nobody we are wired to solve problems and we're wired for progress and we're unfortunately wired for fear as well. But what I'm saying, what you're saying is, is if the problem is food going bad, then someone's going to invent a refrigerator. And then in the blink of an eye, everyone's going to have a refrigerator in their house because that's exactly. a major problem. Yes. So in we're, we're wired to notice the problems and then we're wired to fix and solve the problems problems as quickly as possible and, and then profit it, off it. Yes. And that's, that's, that's what entrepreneurs define do. We make the world a better place by everybody. It's like, I teach people, okay, during this time of pandemic, when you see a problem, write it down and think about how do you start a business to solve that problem? Right. It's, it's a beautiful mind ninja move, right? Instead of seeing the problem, see opportunities and then go and solve it. So, you know, the, the challenge is really, we see problems far out in the distance. We, so for example, you use the example of a catalytic converter, which about acid rain and all of those problems. The predictions, we saw what was going to be happening in 20 or 30 years, and people moved that prediction up to today as if the disaster is about to happen tomorrow. But what they forget is that during the interim time, people are solving problems, and the power that we have to solve problems, the tools that we have, again, now we have more tools than ever before. You know, back in the 70s, we didn't have AI and 3D printing and robotics. There's, you know, the problem of having access to enough um, ventilators. Guess what? People are beginning to 3D print ventilators and, and manufacture them in new and novel ways and open source them. When we see problems, we solve them. That's the world we're living in.
Right. So the problem with watching the news or oftentimes hearing what the experts have to say, going back to the catalytic converter, is they go, well, in 1974, the population of Los Angeles was 2.7 million and they had 1 million cars. Now the projection is in 25 years, it's going to be 10 million with 7.5 million. And according to my calculations, 7.5 million cars is six times as much as 1.5. And then we're going to have six times as much pollution in the air. But what they didn't count on is somewhere between now and 30 years, someone's going to invent a catalytic converter and we're actually going to have less than we had in 1974 during the original prediction. So you can't just take what's happening right now and extrapolate it because that would be like saying, well, the amount of time it takes to get from uh, California to Oregon on a wagon train is um, 81 days. It's like, okay, so in the future, it's going to take 81 days for this many people. It's like, no, no, we're going to invent an airplane and we're going to do it in an hour and 20 minutes. And we do that over and over and over again. Our, we are, our minds are locally linear. We're living in a global and exponential world. And one of the things that, you know, is gonna transform, you know, autonomous cars are gonna transform uh, where we live, how we live, the impact on the environment, all of these things. And so we just tend to take the way it is right now and project that forever. But I can guarantee you one thing, <laughs> everything's changing. And it's changing faster and faster. No, you know, it's always interesting whenever I see an Elvis movie where he plays a gun shooter from the from the from 1861. He has the same hair with the pomade, you know, combed back. You're talking about Star Trek, you know, watching seeing Shatner with the very 60s looking mop and everything. It's like that's kind of what we do. We just kind of take the same styles and hair and stuff. And we just project it off you know, off into the future, a thousand years, and we're all wearing the same hairstyles we are now. It's like, yeah, that's how we work. Like, that's how we're wired. And I th I'm wondering, and I'm guessing, that newer generations may not be wired that way. Like, my kids grew up around change and computers, and they're 13, 13 year old twins. But I don't know, their concept, like, take the concept of, asking them what they want to do for a living. When I was a kid, it had to end with the word man. You want to be a garbage man, you want to be a fireman, you want to be a policeman. I just thought there'd be a man job for me, you know? And it was like, <laughs> eh, construction man, fi fireman, policeman. You know, my son, he doesn't have a man at the end of his job title. He has anything he wants to do and probably nine jobs simultaneously. You know what I mean? It's a yeah, I, I have, I have, different world. I have... Uh, uh, eight and a half year old fraternal boy twins, and um, oh boy, yeah, yeah. and uh, and so uh, yeah, for them they want to be YouTubers, uh, game designers, <laughs> right? You know? So it's like you know it's inter it's interesting, but I guarantee you one thing, um, you can make a career out of anything these days. Truly oh. make a career out of anything. I mean, you well, got to make a career out of talking to people. <laughs> I, I, their dad's a professional podcaster, so what am I going to tell them? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that'll never work. Or these harebrained schemes. You got to go to welding school. I'm telling you, <laughs> welding, that's the future. <laughs> but what about, what about that? I'm a, I'm a trades guy at heart. It's my background's in building. I've always been a little kind of micro-esque on talking up the trades and talking up the sort of nobility of working with your hands. And one of the things about this future you're talking about the sort of computer driven futures we've we've all blown past all these plumber electrician carpenter and all that kind of stuff but stuff that can't be really outsourced and automated as easily and we're all finding out now that during this downtime we don't need professors but we do need truck drivers and we do need a guy to come in and unclog the drain if the toilet's backing up what is your thoughts slash predictions about trades and yeah. people doing that you know you got the golden gate bridge behind you uh that i'm looking at right now and uh you know that was built by a whole bunch of trades guys yeah. uh there'd be less of them building that bridge today but they'd still need trades guys 
So there will be change. The question is, what is the timeline for it, right? We're going to see robotics playing more and more a role. We're going to see AI playing a role. We're going to see 3D printing playing a role in a lot of different areas. But it's going to be the trades, the tradesmen and tradeswomen are going to need to partner with this technology versus get displaced by it. Mm -hmm. um, to do what they're doing faster, cheaper, better, and safer. Um, and so I've seen brick laying machines, right, that can lay bricks much more precisely, much faster. Uh, one of the one of the companies I've supported is uh, it's a nonprofit. It's called New Story, and they three D print houses. Right, right? it's ten thousand yeah. dollars to three D print a house, but it doesn't meet codes here. So it's homes in Mexico and South and Central America that three D printing that can withstand a, you know, a category four, uh, four or five hurricane, but it's different than what we're doing, but it is still a fundamental reinvention of how you manufacture homes. So one of the questions ultimately is most people, you and I are lucky, we get to do what we love doing. For a lot of the world, people, their jobs are the job they could get to put food on the table and get insurance for their family. It's not yeah. what they dreamed about doing as a child. So, no. and, and that's not just around, you know, I grew up with white people in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley. Very few of us are doing what we want to do. Many yeah. of the guys I grew up with are on a construction site right now. Yeah. They didn't dream of that. And so we're going to start to do two things. We're going to start to separate uh, what do you do for because you love doing it versus what you do for a living. And we're also going to separate what you, how you earn income versus what you do with your time. You know, I think that uh, a lot of people are going to be able to spend time in partnership with AI, with robotics, with other tools, um, doing what they enjoy doing, creating. I, I'm not going to go into the larger list of what they could do, but they're not going to be a uh, cash register operator because Amazon Go is getting rid of that position. They may not be truck drivers in the future because autonomous cars are doing that. But if they want to, they could. But I think we're going to start to separate how we make your, how you earn your income. I, I think there will eventually be a version of universal basic income. I, I'm, I'm a libertarian capitalist. So the idea of socialism doesn't you know, sit well with me, but I think we're going to have a version of that in the future. Well, let's drill down a little bit on that because um, you're introducing some thoughts into my head, which is I worked at McDonald's. I worked the grill exclusively at McDonald's. I did the grill. I made burgers all day. And then when we had downtime, they tell me to sweep and mop the dining area. Those are two jobs that are miserable, miserable. Also, I work cleaning carpets out of high school, miserable cleaning carpets. And then I dug ditches and that was miserable as well. Those are all jobs that are easily replaced by something other than a human being, right? I mean, you just don't, the cash register, these are all miserable jobs. So like- They're called, they're called dull, dangerous, or dirty. Right, the, the triple Ds of, of yeah. jobs. And so the good news for all the people that are freaked out about no work in the future, well, the first stuff that's gonna go is the dull, dangerous, dirty, and doesn't pay jobs. <laughs> the, the, le the, the most miserable I've ever been is the least I've ever been paid. You know, <laughs> working McDonald's grill was you know, 3.25 an hour, cleaning carpets was six bucks an hour, and digging ditches was seven bucks an hour. That's the, easily the least I've ever made in my life per hour with the, most, mi the highest misery index with the lowest amount of pay. And the construction stuff was dangerous, crawling around underneath condemned buildings and digging foot things and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to eliminate a lot of jobs that you don't wish upon your worst enemy, right? And so that's good news. On the other hand, where are these people going to go? How are they going to support themselves? And are we going to create this class that I'm already seeing it? You see it in California. You see it in the tech industry. You have ultra ultra wealthy with third world type impoverishment 
living in the same basic area at the same time. Is that chasm going to keep growing? So let me, let me reframe this for you, because I think it's a really important. There is a growing wealth poor divide, but that's not where we should be focusing our, our thoughts. So here's, here's how we would describe for all of human history, Adam, there was the king and the queen on the hilltop and everyone else in abject squalor, right? It was, or the pharaoh and all the slaves. I mean, it's just for all of human history, that's what it was. It's only recently we started to have a middle class. Um, and so I think about the notion that there is the have and the have nots was most of human history. And what's going on right now is we're going from have and have nots to haves and super haves. Right. Right. So we're raising the base where today the poorest people in America, if they want, still have access to things that the kings and queens and robber barons never had, whether it was a flushing toilet or air conditioning or even a cell phone, the poorest people in the world have access to the world's knowledge. And so I, what I'm fighting towards is how do we create a world in which we uplift every man, woman, and child, where we meet the basic needs of every man, woman, and child. And yes, there will be people living for a thousand years on Mars that are trillionaires. And that's okay. As long as we have an ability to uplift every man, woman, and child so that a mother, when their children are born, know that that child has access to the best education on the planet, the best healthcare on the planet, all the food, water, energy that they want. And then it's up to them what they do with that, with that possibility. Because that's not the way it's been, but that is the way we can, we can create. I call this, my first book was called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think, and it lays out the principles that this is where we're heading. Well, so it's interesting. What you're saying is there's not gonna, it's not that there isn't gonna be a chasm the question is, is what is the definition of poor? What is the definition of have nots? I mean, if you just look at it in a sort of micro way, I have a small business, I have employees, I make a shitload more money than they do, but ostensibly our lives aren't that different. They have phones, I have a phone. They have a nice TV, I have a nice TV. They have reliable transportation. They have access to medical care. They have entertainment. They have the same movies I see in the same theaters or on demand or whatever it is. It kind of pisses me off to be, to be honest, but we have the same life. I mean, yeah. I, I live, I have, a, <laughs> I have a bigger house than yeah. they have. And I have uh, a couple of Paul Newman race cars. But and you have, you have more of a pain in the ass responsibilities than they have probably. Right, but we don't <coughs> really, our life isn't, my quality of life is not much better or much different than theirs. If you ask any one of us, what are you doing this weekend? Their answer formally would be, I'm going out to do this micro beer fest in Encino, and then we're going to go out to eat. There's a sushi place. It's got all you can eat to get there. Now, the difference is, is their sushi place is all you can eat, but you got to get there before seven. And mine is, I'll show up at nine. I don't give a shit. But the point is, we're, we're still doing the same stuff, and they're hopping on Southwest yeah. flights and going to the Bay Area. They're and, flying in the air? They're flying That's in the air. Amazing. On the That's same crazy. Plane. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not trying to sound like an out of touch douche. I'm just saying their quality of life is is ostensibly the same as as mine. They have a they have less square footage. I have more responsibility. It may even even out in the in the long run. And so what you're saying is is we're going to have to redefine what poor is just because you don't have nearly as much money as the next guy doesn't mean you're poor, or if you are poor, then it's moot because you have access to healthcare, water, food, shelter, air conditioning, cell phone, transportation. So it's academic if you're poor in a, in a, in a way. Am I couching that correctly? Yeah, it is, it is the difference. What's, we're, we're demonetizing and democratizing all the things that used to call us, us money. So if you think about on your cell phone today, a kid, right? And there's more cell phones than there are humans. A, a, poor, a poorest child uh, anywhere on the planet on a feature phone, smartphone, Android phone, on that phone, 
that person has access to millions of dollars of shit that we would have had to pay for, for free, right? They have two-way video conferencing called FaceTime, which is amazing. I mean, we can video around the world for free. You have high definition video and still cameras and games and books and libraries. In, in the back of my first book, Abundance, I, I add up roughly how much you have and you have millions of dollars of stuff that we disregard, that we don't think about. And that's what's happening. So the, be the poorest people on the planet in the near future will be chauffeured around by an autonomous car. Energy will be free. The best education and healthcare in the world will not be delivered by some sage on a stage, some old guy sitting in front of you, boring the shit out of you. It's gonna be delivered by an AI that knows the best and is the best educator for the poorest child or the wealthiest child. It's leveling the playing field in a way that's uplifting everybody in an amazing fashion. And people, you know, that's part of what I wanna help, help people see that. So, you know, in my Abundance Digital community, that's what I'm trying to do is help entrepreneurs understand what they, where they can create value on the planet. Peter, uh, I know you have a hard out. That's a good note to go out on. I feel like we should just continue this series uh, of conversations. So I'm up for the next one, pal. I, uh, I'm a fan and I'm now a bigger fan. And uh, I, I, I just love, I love your, your head on this stuff. And uh, I don't uh, know anything about technology, but I do know when someone makes sense. <laughs> and uh, you, my friend, make sense. So I'll let you bug out and I'll give you some plugs and take care of a little business here. And hopefully we'll do this uh, again very, very soon. Let's do that. And I'd love to connect with you uh, offline if we could. Yeah. I'm, uh, we're both in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Yeah. All so right. We'll, we'll make we'll this, uh, we'll make this happen. Thank you very much, Peter. Take care. Uh, I will uh, tell you about uh, light stream. That's what I wanted to say. Pay off those uh, high interest uh, credit cards with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. Roll balances from multiple cards into one single monthly payment. Lightstream's credit card cons uh, consolidation. That's what I want to say. Their loans, their consolidation loans, they have rates from just 5.95 APR with auto pay and they're absolutely no fees. So instead of all the super high rates on credit cards and other loans, roll them all in one place, consolidate them, take care of them with one payment and pay as little as 5.95%. You can even get your money as uh, soon as you apply and you can get your money as soon as uh, the day you apply. Apply today, get special interest and uh, special interest rate and discount and save money only with this uh, discount code. Go to lightstream.com slash Adam. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Adam, right, Dawson? Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.5 auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Adam for more information. Ooh, Kyle Dunnigan is uh, coming on on uh, Monday's show. So we got that to look forward to. And we're going to do some interesting technology that Chris has been monkeying around with as far as his face and the celebrities he portrays. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, you can go to uh, chassis, C-H-A-S-S-Y dot com and uh, check out all our movies and uh, you can uh, pre-order. I'm your emotional support animal. It's available for pre-order on Amazon and other places you get books. And just go to amcroll.com for all the stuff you need. Peter Diamantes, uh, everybody. Uh, the future is faster than you think. A very interesting guy, as you guys have heard. It's available on Amazon and also his website, futureloop.com slash C19 and abundance.digital. So until next time, this is Adam for Peter Diamantes and Gina Grad and Bald Ryan saying mahalo. Stick around. The Ace Man will be right back with Dave Damashek in today's episode of Good Sports.